uh, this morning with such an incredible group of innovators. Um, you and had an entry in the MATIC Awards yesterday, which most of you did. Um, congratulations, because you are already on your road to incredible things, being an inventor and helping your patients. And we have, um, like Kathleen mentioned, we have been doing the Matic Awards for years and we have gotten to know people and we've gotten to know friends. And um, I teach at Cabarrus College um, one day a week, Amy is full time, and we have enjoyed um, having our students do projects and encouraging them. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. <coughs> so we often start with a problem. Um, where our patients have a problem, something doesn't exist, there is. Um, a need for a certain piece of equipment, and so who's better than occupational therapists and occupational therapist systems that problem something? So around your office, or your lab, or your home, you have a variety of objects. Maybe you have some paper clips, some toilet paper roll, uh, you have some gears, maybe an office chair. What can you do with all that stuff? Um, OTs and OTAs are known to kind of become pack rats throughout the years because we see the opportunity in everything, every piece of everything we see. I've got to use that, i got to keep it, I have a use for that. So if you're not there yet, students, you will be, I promise, make some space in your attic, have a bag with you at all times. Yes. My manager despairs because my room is messy. I go around the halls picking up pieces of foam, pieces of star foam, and, and um, everything else that I can find. So the challenge with any assistive technology, be it low-tech, high-tech, anything else, is there isn't a lot of great evidence. We were hoping to sort of have lots of references, um, and there really isn't a lot on assistive technology. And I think there needs to be more, so this is a plug for doing research. Um, but also, um, our patients are, they don't have fit the same box. Um, they have very specific needs, they have very specific physical, um, cognitive sorts of issues, and a lot of times we, they need individualized solutions and that um, come, falls to us to be able to do that. So kind of the premise where we're starting with is, you know, all of our patients know that we come to the table with something a little different. Um, we have these unique skills of um, problem solving. We look at things scientifically, but also very creatively. And that sets us apart from a lot of different professions, as you all know. Um, and they know that we can help them, uh, and they come to us for unique help. They say, I can't do this. Or we ask them, what are you having trouble doing? And they tell us. And it's our professional responsibility to them as clients to help them find a way to do that. And sometimes that has to go really beyond what exists. Um, and that's really what makes the difference for our clients. A lot of times it's a completely new um, idea or changing something that already exists, tweaking it a little bit to fit their specific needs. And we really do have the power to make a difference. So we just like this picture. It really is a science and an art. It's the creative side as well as the analytical side to be able to put those two. And I think occupational therapists do that better than a lot of other um, professions and be able to kind of marry those two sides of our brain and pull those together. So when we look at the problem solving, how we're unique um, as occupational therapists and therapy assistants is we are keen observers. So we use our eyes and we really look very carefully. My husband says to me all the time, Amy, you have such a good um, eye for seeing things and for seeing patterns. He's like, I don't know how you do it. Help me solve this problem. Um, so we use our eyes. We also use our hands to put all those different pieces together, the paper clips, the toilet paper tubes, and everything else that we have around us. So we're very hands-on, and we are keen listeners to our clients. We have to be careful not to just think that we have the answers without listening to what they have to say back to us. We have to be very careful about, we give, we present them a great idea, and then they're like, it doesn't work. We're like, but, but it works, I made it, you have to use this. And they're like, but it doesn't work. I need something more simple. So we have to keep always keep that in mind as well. So all that comes together with using our brain for that problem solving. 
<laughs> so when you start adding all these pieces and parts up together, you know, hopefully you're coming up with a solution, whether it's scrap pieces of splinting material, whether it's a piece of wire, what, what a piece of velcro, whatever it is, hopefully those, all those tool pick rolls and rubber bands and things add up to, into a solution. And so this is one of my um, favorite gentlemen. He had some space um, underneath the seat of his wheelchair. I don't know if you can tell in the drawers there are things like tape measures and um, all sorts of tools that <laughs> might need at a moment's notice. So he had in his drawers. Um, he also, um, we attached bags onto the front of his um, wheelchair to be able to carry his phone and his keys and that kind of thing. On the armrest, um, on the right side of the picture, there's actually a thing that um, flips off for his drink and flips down onto the way. He also had a communication device and there was a little mount to be able to hold that um, uh, and all kinds of amazing things. So um, the OT solution is sort of in action right here. Totally tricked out wheelchair. <laughs> And then it really is important to be client-centered. This particular gentleman um, has ALS. <laughs> he um, cannot use his arms. Um, and he also does not have a lot of diaphragmatic power to be able to suck up a really long straw. So a lot of the drink holders are down quite low. And, it's, and even the um, drink holders on the gooseneck from below um, attached to the seat rail really couldn't get it close enough. So um, we attached on the side of his headrest. You guys have probably seen the lock line booth in the, um, in the exhibit hall, and that's what this is, to be able to make a drink holder with a very short straw so that it can manage that. And so it really was about working with him, being client-centered, not my idea, but his idea, and then me helping to kind of make that happen. And then simple as best. This particular person um, didn't have the use of her voice, um, and she typed. Um, through her voice recognition um, and through her um, speaking software. And she was very frustrated with having to hold her iPad with one hand and only type with one hand because she was an extremely fast typer and she wanted to keep up with the conversation. So um, we had, I tried lots of ideas, but I went with the simplest possible. I just bent some pieces of material and used Velcro and put a big piece of Velcro around her neck and she was able to. Um, type with both hands and it was stable enough because the piece of splitting material that's against her body had a little bit of dice on so it's not gonna it doesn't slip and pivot um, and so we played around with this solution for about a half an hour um, at our ALS clinic and, and made it work so okay so a half hour isn't that pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but simple is certainly best I mean we could have found something that was specifically for this purpose or you know could have cost a hundred dollars but it was really just scrap material and she's quite happy. Look how happy she is with that. <laughs> Typing away. So I mentioned earlier the feedback. So I really encourage you as you are letting innovators um, to ask for feedback. Feedback can be a little scary um, because we're not sure what somebody's going to say about our grand idea. And so we have to really be open and try to be objective about our um, opportunity to receive feedback. So a couple places that comes from is from the client and from their family because the family is an important key piece in that. They are helping, oftentimes helping that client with um, their adaptive equipment, with their ADL, with whatever IADL, whatever they're going to be doing, their occupation of living. Um, they need to be able to have some input as well because it affects them too. And then peer feedback, super important. Um, what I, I used to have my students just work individually on their projects and um, I found over time that they were just kind of okay. Their projects were okay, but it was missing something. And so I changed the projects to require them to work in pairs and get some feedback. And then they go along their whole process. They have to start very early getting feedback from me, checking in with me over time. I, I actually tell them like, before they're even in the class. Hey, by the way, next semester, this is what you have to look forward to. Start thinking, start getting those ideas together. And then they work together and get that peer feedback. Oftentimes, we have one kind of like a tunnel vision idea of this is how we think it should be. This is a great idea. And then somebody comes along and says, yeah, but what about this? And then you have to rethink your total idea, maybe start over from scratch, um, look at the whole thing differently. But that is the beauty of your feedback and not taking that feedback um, negatively but actually seeking it out and asking for that feedback. Um, Amber and I um, do that a lot. Um, John out there uh, introduced us to his uh, peer feedback person. They bounce ideas off. So find somebody that you can trust 
and that is going to give you honest feedback, not just, hey, that looks great, good job, but you really want to get that, that juicy feedback from them so you can have the best product possible for your client. So we wanted to show a few of the things that we have done over the years. Um, the top right picture, um, this was actually designed by a client and I made it. And he decided he was going to call it the tow troller. And he had no use of his arms. Um, he had an upper motor um, or an upper body predominant version of ALS, so he had no use of his arms. His big toe was too big to hit the tiny little um, remote keys for his TV. He couldn't use a large remote because it wouldn't work with his cable box. So, you know, three cents of splinting material later, and we have a little pointer called the tow troller. And so that one in 2010, that was the really, the first thing I think I ever entered at Matic, and, um, and uh, very motivating, obviously, to win um, uh, second place for that one. Um, the gooseneck jerkade is on the bottom right, and I'll talk about that on the next slide a little bit. The keyboard assist was last year, and I had a woman um, who has MS, and um, for her very first login, she wasn't allowed to use sticky keys. She only had the use of one hand. And the IT people made her do control out delete to log in the very first time. Well, as anybody knows, you have to have two hands to do control out delete. So this keyboard assist, I was wandering Home Depot um, and found a U-bolt, but it wasn't heavy enough to hold down the key. So I added a few more bolts and just kept adding bolts and then it tipped over. So I added some little felt on the bottom just so it would stay and this sort of thing and added and finally got it to the point where it would stay upright. It would hold down the control and all. So all she used it was for five seconds once a day. Um, put it on there, hit delete, go. Um, but it makes an amazing difference in her life and she doesn't have to have a coworker or a friend log her in. Um, and so, you know, it literally was 50 cents um, for the U-bolt and uh, probably six cents each for the little bolts and it really was an amazing thing. And so I think, um, I, I always have been under the um, feeling that simple is best. Um, but some of these things were, maybe they only used five seconds a day, but they make a difference. This gooseneck trinket, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how this process goes. And um, on the left picture is my box of stuff. I had some gooseneck, I had some long straws, um, and what I wanted to do is um, gooseneck straws exist. They already exist on the market, as do one-way valve straws that have a little ball bearing in the bottom. So when you slurp to the top, it stays at the top those little straws. So my patients with ALS can't slurp on a gooseneck straw three feet long. They don't have the diaphragmatic power to slurp that many times throughout the day on a regular gooseneck straw. So I started playing around with attaching the two together. Um, I went to my favorite hardware store that has lots of little men who know lots of things that want in the store trying to help me. Instead of, of course, home people in low is when they're all up 20 years old and they don't know anything. But you go to the place where there's 80 year olds and they, they will wander the store. We had to find ball bearings that were stainless steel because they were going to be used for a drink and we had we used refrigerator tubing and we tried to kind of put it all together and they helped me um, and actually made it so that when you have a three foot long straw, and the drink will stay at the top. I had to add a sort of series of ball bearings to make enough power to hold that much liquid up at the top and it ended up working out great and I've actually given it to a couple of my clients with ALS who put it in a drink holder on the back and then the gooseneck straw is there when they need it. So it's, it's always um, quite a process but um, that was a winner. Um, I second place in one of the years. And so I'll talk a little bit about my experience with Matic. I, I was first introduced to Matic as a student. And I was a student in an OTA program in 2006, which seems like a long time ago, but really wasn't that long ago. And um, it was in Charlotte, and our professor encouraged us to enter the Matic, and I said, sure, I'll do this. And so I did, and I won first place that year. And I was a judge. I did not know we her. We didn't even judge her. Which is so cool. Um, and uh, received my check from... Mr. Landsberger, and that was quite an honor, and I just remember him as just being so joyful and just loving um, the innovation and so supportive of students, and I love that about him. Um, and then I've done various, various things um, over the years. These are the ones that I've um, been honored to have been judged by the judges as being worthy of getting a Matic Award. Um, the Stove Novices I'll talk about in a moment. Um, the One Hand Hair Band was 2011, and um, I had so many clients that were women with uh, CBAs that could not put their hair in a ponytail. 
And women, you have long hair on a day that you're getting up and you don't have the energy or the time to get to your therapy appointment and do your hair nicely, you just want to throw in a ponytail, right? That just takes too much energy. And they kept asking me, how can I do this? I've got to put my, my hair in a ponytail. I don't want to wait for my daughter. God forbid my husband do that. Um, I need to do it myself. So I started the long process of trying to figure that out. And boy, it was a process. Um, but came up with, I think, a pretty good uh, design for that. And uh, then last year, some of you were talking yesterday about the ATM Assist. I'm like shocked it stood out in your minds. But just a very simplistic um, uh, device to help a lady with spinal cord injury be able to use the ATM independently. Um, with a little bit of setup, ready to go. There's a picture of it right there. And just uh, clips to her ATM card and she can just use it independently because she drives. And, and she only had two of these, correct? And she pieces. couldn't pull the card out of the yeah. ATM. <laughs> That's correct. But, so that just enabled her to be independent. She was thrilled um, with that. As you can see, you see a theme. All of our stuff is very low tech. Um, I don't have a, a, a lot of high tech in my head. I'm just very low tech. And, and that seems to be pretty good for my clients. Um, the process of innovation, just to talk about it a little bit. Um, you know, sometimes my students will say, I'm going to go, or they, they say, Amy, I did a whole search of the internet, and I spent hours and hours and hours trying to find out what's not out there. And I say, you are wasting your time. You can't try to figure out what's not out there to solve a problem. You have to first identify the problem. Find someone who needs something. Find someone who can't do something and who needs to be able to do it and wants to be able to do it and then work with them. So um, identifying the problem, number one. And then finding out what your client's strengths are. There's something called appreciative inquiry. We've heard of that. But it's looking for the strengths. What do we have as a strength? So I would support that that works with our clients as well, appreciating what their strengths are and then trying to work with those strengths and helping to solve the problem. Keeping all options on the table. In the beginning, nothing is off the table. Put it all on the table, think about all of it, dwell on it, get that peer support, um, ask the client. Don't discount any idea, because that idea, even though if it doesn't work, it might spark the idea that does work. So everything is on the table. And then keep it simple. Um, clients typically don't want anything complicated. Even if it's high tech, simplic simplicity is best. Um, the more complicated the device, we know um, clients probably aren't going to use it. They're going to dish it to the side and say thank you for your efforts, and then they're not going to use it. And so that's not really at the heart of OT. We want them to use and be functional. And then try it out. Try it out. You try it out. The client tries it out. Various people try it out. Get um, lots of input on the device so that you can even make better improvements to it, and then adjust it as needed based on that feedback. So just about the process that I had with the um, stove knob assist, because I started out making it a little more complicated than it ended up being. Um, so I wanted to share that story with you. I had a client who was in a manual chair. She had a stroke to her spinal cord, and what she really wanted to do was cook. That's where she wanted to use her energy. Um, she didn't like the microwave. She wasn't going to cook in the microwave. I don't blame her. I don't like to cook with the microwave. I just want to heat stuff up with it. And so I said, okay, we're going to figure this out. I will help you. And the problem was that she couldn't reach the knobs in the back of her stove very safely or very well. I'm not going to go replace her stove. She's not going to have the money to replace her stove. She has a disability now. She's on limited income. So we had to work with what we had. So we started thinking, okay, she's reaching over. It's not hot to begin with to turn the stove on. If she could reach it, maybe we could use something to help her just reach the knob. So you think reacher, right? Well, if you're using a reacher to push in a knob and turn it, the reacher doesn't have the capacity for pushing and turning. It's just too weak. And so that wasn't going to work for her. So the solution, um, was, okay, well, we know we want to use a reacher because she can use that, but how can we keep it safe? The reacher will keep her arm safe from the stove top, so she won't have a burn, even, you know, over the, when she goes to turn the stove off. 
but how can we get that last piece? What can we put on a reacher that will attach to the knob of the stove and make it functional for her? So I started drawing my design and building my design, and I got my husband involved, who's like my key supporter, and um, I was walking around Home Depot and Lowe's, and um, in my area, there are a couple of older guys, who help, but, but they actually just look at me like, what do you need help with? Like, I'm fine, I'm just looking around, and I'm surely thinking the security people are tracking me, you know, as I'm walking around Home Depot. Um, but I love to go and just think. I look at every aisle and I look at every possible piece of equipment as an opportunity. What could I do with this? How could this work? Could I cut this, change it, um, weld it? What could I do with it to make it work for the client? And this particular time, I had my husband along with me, and because he loves Home Depot, and we were on a date at home. We go on dates to Home Depot. Um, and he said, what about this? So I have to give him credit because it was his idea to use this. So what this is, it's a little hard to see. The very end where you see the um, arrow pointing is actually um, um, an aluminum um, piece that fits between plywood to hold plywood together. So that's what it is, like, you know, 15 cents. I had to buy a big bag, though. And then I'm like, okay, well, that's great. And I had the reacher with me. and it. There's a little magnet on the end of your traditional reacher, and it just stuck right on the, mag on the magnet. So it stayed there really well. And I started getting excited. I'm like, okay, this could work, but is it wide enough? Will it work on the stove? Um, how can we make it not slip? Because stove knobs are slippery. So you know, one of my favorite things is that dip it stuff, where you can spray it on, it's um, rubberized. So we dipped it, and it was perfect. I'm like, wait a minute, this is too easy. This is just too simple of a solution. And um, no, it wasn't. It was the perfect solution because it really works and it's inexpensive. So I offer this idea to you, go to Home Depot, get some of these clips, to give them to your clients to be able to reach those knobs on the back of the stove. Now, stoves change, they're not all like that, but granted, probably some of your clients are gonna have a stove that's old and they're not gonna have the money to change that. Well, and what's exciting about this device is they can easily take it on and off the reacher and throw it in their pocket or keep it, but you can use it. the same type of knobs are for the laundry, dryer, the washing machine. There's a lot of places where this can be used. So let's go make some of these. And then the ATN Assist um, was last year, and I just really um, enjoyed making that. And then the client that I made it for, um, I got an email from one of her friends. Amy, can you make me one too? Can you? I'm like, sure, I'll make it and send it to you. So um, it's spreading. So we really want to talk about inspiring others. Yeah. We, have, we work with students at Cabarrus College, and this is a picture of us with a couple of um, our students from last year. And we really, um, it is an assignment in the class, but I think um, us being a part of the Matic for so many years and really having an interest and a need and a desire to help our clients and to be creative has inspired our students because they see um, our joy and our excitement when we come up with something that works when the process of figuring out the best idea, they come to us for ideas, and I can use my experience with some of my patients with progressive disorders to give them some feedback. Um, and I think that really that process is important. We have a number of students who actually made the trip to come with us this time, um, so that we're not presenting all of their ideas. Um, but I think that um, gives us a chance to inspire them. Um, so this was the Position You Pillow, uh, which won second place last year. Um, Rebecca and Taylor created this um, from scratch. And this is one of the inventions that um, I didn't know a lot about what they were doing. They told me kind of a little bit what they were doing because they have this certain points throughout the semester they have to give an update. But they came to class and everybody was wowed by what they had created, um, even me. And they um, had, there was one of their classmates that was pregnant. She's like, I need that for when I nurse my baby. And it's not just for people with a CBA or need, um, so it's, it's basically for positioning, and their idea came when we were teaching positioning um, in the classroom or in lab, positioning in bed, positioning in the wheelchair, how many pillows do you need for that client to get in position properly, like nine or ten, right, and, and who has nine or ten pillows? So they created this totally from scratch, made a template, sewed it, um, filled it, stuffed it, and the pieces attached, so the top part is like a horseshoe, but the bottom two pieces come apart off of that top piece and can go in any different direction. They have all these little Velcros and snaps all over the device, 
and very quickly can be changed to um, put the client in whatever position they need. There's a couple more pictures of just at Cabarrus College and actually at, um, was it last year's? Uh, two years uh, ago. Two years ago at the Medic Awards in the Expo Hall um, and then booth. On the left is the Pompadour and uh, this was created, um, Clancy and Kristen worked really hard together. Um, Clancy's had a client that um, didn't want, he had a Foley catheter, he didn't want to carry around the big bag, he was ambulatory and um, he needed something a little different and for some reason um, the leg bag on his leg just wasn't working so they designed a little pocket for the leg bag to sit inside of in the pants and it was really successful for him um, and they were pretty pretty thrilled as well. This is our whole um, college class and so everybody, as we mentioned, they worked in pairs. Everybody did create something. Some, of course, were better than others, um, and lots of great ideas. But this is our, our whole thing. So last year, um, Cabarrus College won the first um, Intercollegiate Challenge Award from Maddock, and we were very excited and very proud of that fact. And this is just at our college. This is um, one of our favorite um, slogans. And those of you who are younger may not know who MacGyver is, but MacGyver was like a TV show from the 80s, late the 80s. And, and then he was the kind of guy who would um, get himself into a situation. He would be like in, he'd be trapped or he would be um, attacked or something would happen. And he would have like a piece of gum and a, you know, like a toothpick in his pocket and he would uh, like bomb his way out of, you know, this how it was. Um, so we want you to channel the MacGyver within, um, and of course, what would MacGyver do? If you don't know MacGyver, MacGyver, it's on Netflix, so go check it out. This is quite fun. Um, and I would just challenge you. I had several people come through the awards yesterday who were just walking through the um, exhibit hall. Uh, I'm sorry, through the Matic that didn't even know anything about Matic. Thankfully, we're getting more and more people to come and attend and catch. Um, that inspiration and I said you know she's, the one lady said to me I'm not sure I could ever create anything I said are you an occupational therapist or occupational therapy assistant well yes I said and then you can look for that problem solve it um, be client centered and you could do it so I encouraged her I gave her a challenge next year you're coming to the medic with something right she said okay I'll work on it I said you will so we just do encourage you to keep creating, um, never stop thinking, how can I use my artistic abilities, my creative side, with science and science. the science side together, bring those two sides together to make a difference for your clients. Thank you very much.